All right. Hey, YouTube, how's it going? It's Faz from Faz Lifts. Today, I'm going to be detailing the main differences between training for size versus training for strength. So this is a very relevant topic. There's a lot of talk about hypertrophy, a lot of talk about strength building, and it can get quite confusing for people. And I don't want to add to that body of confusion. You guys should be leaving my videos feeling less confused and feeling more clear on things. So if it's causing you confusion, then I want to address that. And really, I had a couple of comments. I think most people are pretty much on, on board, but I had a couple of comments from my recent hypertrophy focus, which spurned me on to discuss the differences between hypertrophy and strength. I have kind of dealt with this in the comments, but if some people are right thinking this and writing it, it might be worth clarifying as a whole video. So Paladin Dance says, as a late beginner to early intermediate, should I still focus on progressive overload above all else as the main goal for most of my lifts? And this was in a video where I talked about downsets and how to perform exercises correctly. And so the next question here is from Masters Ironman T Armstrong. He says, hey Faz, I thought you stated pretty recently that naturals do not have the luxury of training for strength versus training for size. Do you stand by that? Because here you seem to say the opposite. So <laughs> clearly like there's some confusion there and I wanna spend this entire video kind of going over that. So let's begin. Now, to give you guys a preemptive summary, as I've been doing recently, okay, um, just to give you the source right from the beginning. Preemptive summary is this. Progressive overload applies to both size and strength training. Okay? It is always going to be the result. And in some cases, it might also be the method. So adding more weight to the bar to induce more stress to then create more of an adaptation. But it's almost always going to be the result of getting better in whatever you're doing. It's always going to be what happens. However, it's the method of training that determines what you predominantly build, whether you predominantly build strength or whether you predominantly build size. You're always going to be building some of each. And progressive overload is always going to occur if you're getting better. But how your training is set up is the main difference. So you're always going to be getting stronger. How you do that how you set up your training, how you set up your week, what you pay attention to, which is all the things I'm going to talk about in this video, that's what determines the ratio of size versus strength that you obtain, okay? How you get stronger is the key here, and that is the nuance. And I also want to say at this point, most people who point to like the little strong but shredded guy uh, as a counterpoint to saying that, well, look, some people can be strong without being big. You know, you've heard that before. People say, what about that skinny powerlifter guy? Like, odds are, most of the time, that skinny powerlifter dude is just very lean, pretty well muscled, but also training very specifically for that purpose, for the purpose of strength over size. And usually the people who are pointing that out are usually guys who are fat themselves, who never got lean, who actually don't realize if they did get lean, they'd probably be pretty small. And that's a lot of people who I come across. So that's the preemptive summary. Now let's go into the specifics. And just one more example before we move on. You've heard the advice, you know, progressive overload just gets stronger. Now we can apply that in a different way to sports. These two, one's a sprinter, one's a long distance runner. We can say they're both training to get faster. Just get faster, right? But think about it this way. Think about the type of training they do. There are major differences in the type of training that the guy on the left would do relative to the guy on the right. And that is what means they have very different outcomes. One is getting faster for a sprint. The other is getting faster for a marathon. They're both getting faster. And in the same way, the analogy when it comes to strength building is we're always looking to get stronger. Now, how we set up our training is going to mean that we are getting better in different ways, either specifically stronger or more hypertrophy. We're always going to be getting stronger, though. So just because you're training for hypertrophy doesn't mean you just forget about strength. There are other things to focus on. And as I said to Paladin, you know, you are capable of focusing on more than one thing at a time. You can focus on getting stronger while maintaining excellent form, excellent contraction, great pumps, good intraset rest periods, all that stuff, and you have to do that. So the advice to say, well, the advice of sort of just get stronger is very simplistic, and it leads to this type of differentiation, because then people say, well, 
well, I guess for hypertrophy, maybe I don't need to get stronger. I just need to get bigger. Like, it doesn't make sense. You're always going to get stronger. But the way you set up your week is going to determine how that actually affects your body. So firstly, I think we need to talk about loading. Um, so the weights, the relative, relatively heavy weights. So now repetitions for building and peaking your strength are generally on the lower end. So most of my powerlifting routines typically utilize reps in the three to eight range. Most of my bodybuilding routines utilize reps in the five to 20 range. So there's a definitely a big gap, a big change. Now there is some overlap. So we do utilize higher reps in strength routines, but that's all part and parcel of bringing volumes up without adding undue recovery demands. And I think that's what people look for when they're looking for conjugate and concurrent style of training. They kind of want to feel that they get the best of both worlds. So part of adding in the high repetition work for the strength training guys is to add in that volume, which is going to encourage growth. Another part of it is fatigue management because tendons and ligaments tend to be a lot easier to manage when it comes to high repetitions, lower overall loads. So in terms of the overall basic differences, strength training is going to utilize higher intensities, larger loads. Hypertrophy training in general can utilize a wide variety of intensity and wide variety of loads. So there's a big difference there. With hypertrophy, you can get away with a lot more of variety, which is really good for loading. Now, that, the intensity then, then influences the volume. So based on the type of intensity you have to do, and in powerlifting, you have to do a relatively high level of intensity. You have to do a high level of overall load, particularly with barbell compound lifts. So due to the higher recovery demands of what you're doing as a powerlifter, your individual volume tolerance is going to drop. So on an individual level, so you as an individual, you sat there listening to me right now, you as a, as a powerlifter, are always going to be able to get away with less volume than you as a bodybuilder. Because as a bodybuilder, you have the freedom to have a lot more variety of intensity, of loading, of exercise variety, all that stuff. So typically, this is why you're always going to have more volume on a typical bodybuilding approach over a typical powerlifting approach, always. Even though on some powerlifting approaches, you do end up with quite a high level of volume. It's just never going to be as high as a bodybuilding routine has the potential to be because of the loading. The loading takes more of a toll. So as an example, working sets of, say, three to five reps on the squat, they're hell. If you're anything close to being strong, hard sets of five are horrendous. Recovering from sets of 10, uh, of 10 working sets of squats, let's say sets of five, per week is brutal. However, you could potentially double that volume as a bodybuilder because you can spread out that exercise load across, say, squats, leg extensions, leg presses, pendulum squats. You might not even need to squat. You can do cable exercises, various supersets, intensity techniques. So you can always do a lot more with hypertrophy. So typically, one difference you see when you're training for strength versus size is, typically speaking, for the individual, size training tends to have higher volumes, strength training tends to have lower volumes as a whole. There are, of course, outliers, but as a whole, that's what you can get away with. And some people also choose to do less volume on a hypertrophy routine, not the most sensible choice. And some people choose to do more on a size routine, which can be done if you're training concurrently. But it's not always going to give you the best of both worlds. It'll give you something of both. So next, utilizing variety and recovery. So one of the things about hypertrophy training is you don't have to be entirely fresh to benefit from it. Whereas with squat training, because you're training, say, the squat or close variations like the squat, front squat, SSB squat, you have to be pretty much recovered to go again. Whereas with hypertrophy training, what we see is that there are different systems in the body which recover at different rates. So muscles recover insanely fast, like as little as 12 hours in highly trained individuals. Ligaments and tendons take a lot longer to recover. The nervous system takes a lot longer to recover. So this is the basis for a variety of bodybuilding um, and variety of loading. So for a bodybuilding routine, something like fives on the squat on a Monday, 15s on the leg extension on the Wednesday, and 10s on the leg press on Friday, that's a doable routine. So notice there, we're, we're varying the exercise selection, we're varying the repetitions, and as a result, we're varying the overall load. So there's a massive degree of, of what works in bodybuilding. You're just that you're just wanting to stress the muscle 
muscle recovers super fast. You don't need to wait until the ligaments, the tendons, the nervous system is all recovered to hit the same movement pattern again because you don't care about the movement pattern. You don't care. Like with bodybuilding training, it's not about squatting. It's about leg training. With powerlifting training, it's more about squatting and less about the strength, the relative strength of the legs. So there's a difference there. And if we look at um, a similar kind of routine for, for powerlifting, if we were to do, say, a lot less variation, heavy fives on Monday, heavy fives on Wednesday, heavy fives on Friday, and then you're pretty much in the emergency room by Saturday, precisely with the spine be <laughs> looking a lot like this. So training exclusively in the lower rep ranges means you that routine would be almost impossible for anybody with any decent level of strength and size. Nobody who's actually strong is doing that type of routine. It doesn't work because you'd be broken by the end of the week. So with strength training, just to hammer the point home again, you have to pull back on the volume because you just can't get away with as much. You do pull back on the variety because you don't need as much. You're still going to have some in there, particularly if you're doing concurrent approaches. But with a traditional piloting routine, you're just not going to have that same degree of high level of variety like you would have with a bodybuilding routine because you want your efforts to be more focused towards the lifts you're trying to improve. And as a result, a routine like this, which you're seeing in front of you right now, would be pretty much impossible for anyone who's any reasonable level of strength to do. All right. Now, at this point, I want to just interject with this whole conversation about sarcoplasmic versus myofibrillar hypertrophy. I wanted to put it in because it's something that people will bring up like, well, bodybuilders have more sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, powerlifters have more myofibrillar hypertrophy, or whatever, stuff like that. People always try and slip that in as a conversation. And I've heard that conversation for 20 years. I remember researching that conversation 20 years ago, and we haven't really found out much. All we know is it might be a thing. Now, that's not to say, you know, there aren't differences in terms of what's in the cell. Like, yes, there is sarcoplasm in the cell. There are myofibrils. But the question here is, is it a trainable factor? Can we specifically train for one or the other? So that might be a thing. It also might be genetic. Also, very likely, it might be drug fueled. Now, the research on this, on this is still fairly equivocal, even after 20 years. It's not definite. Equivocal means we're not certain about it. It's not as certain as we are about other things. So it's still very much in its infancy. We don't know a great deal about whether it's a trainable factor. Yes, we know it exists. We don't know if it's a trainable factor. There's a difference, okay? Something can exist, and we don't know, but we don't know it's a trainable factor. Like bones exist. Bone density is a thing. We know bones get more dense, okay? With this, we don't necessarily know if your genetic level of sarcoplasm versus myofibrillars is something you can adapt via training. We just don't know that yet. It's not equivocal. It's not unequivocal. So next thing, which flows on quite nicely from the volume debate, exercise selection for hypertrophy. So as seen previously, exercise selection can be very, very varied for hypertrophy. There is no need to stick to a particular pool of exercises for hypertrophy unless they just work for you. Some people also argue you should vary your exercises when you're training for growth because that will stimulate different regions of the muscle. I, I'm not so sure that's a definite. So for example, some people will say you can influence the inner chest, the outer chest, etc. I'm not talking about different muscles within a, one muscle group, like the bicep is two heads, the tricep is three heads. I'm talking about some people literally say that regional growth is possible with different exercises. Again, that's not... Um, a definite proven thing, but there are murmurs of that. And it's something which anecdotally bodybuilders have been saying for years. But in general, the muscle doesn't really register where the stress comes from. So for hypertrophy, exercise selection can be massively varied because the muscle doesn't care. All it cares about is stress. Not that the muscle cares about anything, but for causing growth, you don't need to care about specific exercises. You can use as much variety as possible, as many different loading repetitions as you like within five to 30. And in fact, you probably should because it allows you to get away with more useful volume. And that is highly correlated towards growth. Other thing is 
when it comes to hypertrophy, we can utilize isolation exercises a lot more than would be useful if we were just entirely focused on strength. We can use isolation lifts to fill in certain areas which are neglected by large compounds. So like, for example, if you are a very lanky squatter, your quads are probably never going to get worked that much from the way you squat. So you're more than likely going to have to fill in with additional quad work until your squat starts to look a bit better because it probably looks like a good morning. So another example is a tricep dominant presser may choose to minimize the, minimize the number of pressing options over the course of a week. Like me, for example, I might hit a bench press, I might hit an incline dumbbell bench, and then I might hit a pec deck and a cable crossover. So half of my chest work is actually isolations because whenever I press, my triceps take over. So I might have a couple of pressing movements in there, one being a dumbbell on an incline, so I can really lean towards pushing my chest, and the rest of it is just chest movements. I might not want to hit a lot of tricep dominant pressing because it's just not very good for my biology because my triceps end up taking up a lot of the load. So that's something which was highly relevant for me when I came from powerlifting into bodybuilding as a change I had to make because I was very tricep dominant. Nowadays, less so. An exercise selection for strength. Typically here, we want to see specificity. Bear in mind, this is for powerlifting. Now, the upside of that is we can use close variations to build strength. Like for example, the bench press, feet up bench press, three count pause bench press, slingshot bench press. These are all bench presses. The incline bench press, it's all a bench press. So we can use specific variations across the week. With squatting, we can use front squats, SSB squats. We can lean towards these things to make us better at the power lift. So typically the reason that people use front squats is to help them be more upright because it's very good the front squats are very good at strengthening the thoracic region of the back, the upper back, keeps you upright, as well as potentially increased quad and glute uh, development as depth is usually a little bit easier to hit when you're front squatting compared to back squatting for most people, at the beginning at least. The downside for exercise selection for strength is the loading stresses, which are previously mentioned, they're only attenuated. They're not entirely removed. So if you rotate between squat a front squat and an SSB squat, that's still a pretty high stress rotation. You're still hitting those deep angles of the squat when you go down. It's very different from the previous example where you might be hitting the squat, the leg extension, the leg press. So for equal volumes, exercise selection for strength needs to be more specific, which is great for influencing certain parts of the squat. But again, it's going to hold you back from doing those high amounts of volume you could get away from if you were doing more isolations or more machine exercise or more variety of loading in general. And also bear in mind when it comes to this type of exercise selection, you're probably still sticking to relatively low to moderate loading ranges. So five to 10 reps or less. All right, next. For, this is for the concurrent bros. So concurrent bros love to be all up in the comments talking about how they've got the best of both worlds. So just to say, hey, you do not have the best of both worlds, okay? You don't. Because whenever you're pulling from one string and you're pulling from another, you're trying to put them together, you're getting less from each. Like as a very real example, if you want to be a concurrent bro and you want to hit your heavy squat single or five, that's going to pull recovery away. No matter which way you which way you slice it, it might not pull recovery away that much, but it is going to pull recovery away. So my analogy for you guys is this. The analogy is similar to bulking cutting versus recomposition, right? Bulking cutting is training for size and training for strength separately. Recomposition is trying to do it both concurrently. Your favorite YouTuber can execute both at the same time, okay? Your favorite concurrent bros can do it. They can do it because usually they're highly dedicated. They're highly involved in what they're doing. They're usually, not always, but they're usually very genetically gifted. Now, if you're not that guy, if you have a full-time job, kids, everything else, if you regularly miss meals, you miss your cardio, you miss your sleep, you miss your training, you might not get away with doing both concurrently. It might look great on paper. Like I've got this wonderful program, everything's fitting into place. But when it comes to actually doing it, your progress might be just so ridiculously poor, it's not worth it. And you'd be better off just going for size versus strength rather than trying to get the best of both worlds, like a lot of recomposition bros do, and they get nowhere. Like Yes, it's possible. No one's saying it's not. Concurrent training is possible. No one's saying it's not. Are you going to be able to get away with it? Eh. If you have all your ducks in a row, sure. But if you've failed on bulk and cutting cycles before, what makes you think you're going to recomposition out of 
all of a sudden. It's not an easier option. It's a harder option. And it's the same with concurrent training. If you fail to gain a appreciable amount of strength and, and size, what makes you think you can do both at the same time? It seems insane to me. So just make sure you concurrent bros are not in a situation where you're trying to train concurrently by gaining the best of size and strength, and you're also trying to recomposition at the same time. Ultimately, your program looks like it's going to achieve a great deal, but the reality is you won't achieve much because no, very little focus is being applied to any one thing at a time. So just be wary of that. Understand you're not getting the best of both worlds. There's always a trade-off. But if you want to do that, if you insist on doing it, some small suggestions for you. Keep the barbell work at a minimum level to progress. Okay, Minimum for you to progress is whatever you need to progress. So it could be as little as once a week on the main lift. I've even heard some people alternate the squat and deadlift week by week. That's not a bad way to go. Fill in with hypertrophy work. So push the hypertrophy work in so you're up to about 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. Very much lean on the type of accessories which support your main lift. So you're looking at things more like the close grip bench and weighted dips for tricep development rather than extensions and push downs. Lean towards high impact solutions wherever possible while still allowing yourself the high degree of variety you needed to actual hypertrophy your muscles. And again, this is usually why people work in more of a conjugate style because it just fits and makes sense because you can vary things really well. So that's one way of doing things. Now, it's one way that I teach my clients because I do have a conjugate style approach for my high-level strength clients. However, another way which is potentially better, and this is something I use for my, my hybrid clients, so power, power builder type of people, I think this is a potentially a better strategy. Have periods of time during the course of the year where you're alternating both. So this is potentially a better strategy. Like you can be big and strong, but maybe just not at the same time. Like your biggest and your strongest. I would personally utilize different phases of training across the year to push both. So hit four to six months of powerlifting training, culminate in a peak. And when your body is at the point where it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm exhausted. I'm my tendons and ligaments feel like they have been through a war because I've been pushing powerlifting for four to six months. Then utilize the rest of the year to get bigger and stronger, potentially get leaner as well, so that you can come back to powerlifting and peak that strength later. It works tremendously well. And it also works with the natural ups and downs of life. You can't focus on one thing forever. Not many people can without getting burnt out. It pays to have a, to have a fresh perspective on your goals, to ensure that your goals are fresh and they're forward thinking. So it's not a bad way to arrange the year. And it's how I do it with a couple of my clients. And they appreciate moving the stress away, moving the focus away from one particular style of training so that when they go back into it, they are fully focused. And when they go into the new training, they are fully focused. By the end of the year, they can have both. Maybe just can't have it both at the same time as effectively as they would do otherwise. Okay, so some examples. Here are some examples of leg training done in different ways. So strength, hypertrophy, and concurrent style. So for strength, this is taken directly from um, one of my eBooks. High bar, squat, up to a single, plus three sets of it, three to eight. Wednesday, contest squat for five light triples. Friday, front squat for three sets of three to eight. So that is six, roughly seven, seven to maybe nine, depending on how you count the light work, work sets of of squats. Now, that's a pretty reasonably brutal level of work because if you're hitting the squat movement pattern three times a week, four heavy sets, it's going to be a lot to recover from if you're decently strong. Now, for hypertrophy work, you can effectively double that volume. So we have here squats for three sets of 10 to 12, leg presses for three sets of 10 to 12, Thursday, pendulum squat for three sets of 10, 10 to 20, leg extension, three drop sets for say 10 to 20 as well. So with the strength routine, it was very specific to the movement pattern. They were all squats. The repetitions were generally lower. The weights used were generally higher. For the hypertrophy routine, there is at no point during the course of that week are you repeating a movement pattern. Squats are very different to leg presses and they're very different to pendulum squats and they're very different to leg extensions. You're also mixing and matching different repetition schemes and they're typically higher reps lower overall loading so you can get away with a lot more now if we were to try and mold that into a concurrent style of training i'll take this 
from another one of the examples of how I set up my training for my concurrent guys. Monday, high bar squat for one single, maybe with three back off sets of five to 10. Thursday, you might want to try and fill in with some additional volume to try and get some hypertrophy going. So front squats, three sets of five to 10, leg presses, three sets of 10 to 20. So we're able to bring in exercises there, which allow us to pump the volume up and get the volume about midway between full strength versus full size by utilizing a wider range of variety, leaning towards squatting patterns, but also still pulling for some leg pressing and varying the repetitions again. So it's, it's like midway through. But again, just to point out, it's certainly not the best of both worlds, but it certainly is both worlds. And it is for when you are happy accepting slower progress on one or the other to accept better progress on both at the same time. Okay. So in terms of my summary and concluding thoughts, um, powerlifting training utilizes in general much higher intensities, more exercise specificity, and as a result, lower volumes. Hypertrophy training is far more flexible and can utilize a wider variety of intensities, far more exercises, and as a result, typically higher volumes. So when it comes to training for size versus strength, how you set up the training is massively different. But at the end of it, these two groups of people are always going to be aiming to get stronger. But it's just getting stronger within the confines of the particular routine. So to go back to my analogy of the, um, the runners, the marathon runners and the sprinters, they're both training to get faster. But the way their training is set up leads to massively different outcomes. The way they approach training is massively different. So it doesn't mean to say that they're both just getting faster so they can both do whatever. Like there are specific methods of training, but the end result is they're both aiming to get faster, just in very different ways. Just like with hypertrophy versus strength training, yes, you're going to get stronger, right? But very, very different methods of getting there, okay? And uh, just one final thing, beginners, intermediates, and advanced are on a very highly sliding scale of what they can accomplish concurrently. So I would say the more advanced you are, the more it behooves you to pick a lane and at least do that for a few months of the year before switching over. Concurrent training at the highest levels is a lot more difficult. And I tend to see that only really occurring with those who are very gifted. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Like you, that might not be you. Like yes, again, to give you the analogy, everyone can do a body recomposition. Everyone can gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. Everyone is physically capable of doing that. The mechanisms for how that happens are there. Will you do that? It's probably going to be easier if you get to your goal via bulking and cutting. In the same way, are you going to get to the end by just throwing everything that you can at it? So by training for size, for strength, for muscle, for fat loss at the same time, are you going to be able to do that? You, if you have had, say, trouble with doing the individual goals previously. I'll just tell you this, guys. I couldn't. I couldn't. Like, I've achieved pretty decent things in powerlifting and bodybuilding. I never did them concurrently. I never did them concurrently. Like, to achieve my best, I had to fully go into each endeavor, and that's how I did it. And I also know at some point, if I want to be really, really good at marathon training, because you guys know I'm running now, I'll have to go fully into that as well. I'm not quite at that point yet. But once I become intermediate at a runner, advanced maybe, I'm going to have to think long and hard about the time I put into the gym, if that's something I want to do. So hopefully this video was useful. It's provided you with a bit of a reality check about what your expectations of yourself should be, and also provided you with some clarity about this whole um, getting stronger type of thing, because there was some confusion on it before. Getting stronger is always important, but the method, the style of training is much more of a determinant of where you're going to end up and what you're going to build. All right, folks, if you have enjoyed that video, subscribe, share it, tell people about my channel. I'd like to grow my channel a bit and get it bigger. So it um, helps me to reach people because I think I've got a good message. So if you agree, share this around, like it, subscribe, all that good stuff. Comment as well is great. And um, I'll speak to you all in the next one. Adios.